You go first then. First, first then. <laughs> That's right. Now it doesn't really matter. I can go first. I can go last. It doesn't matter. I don't matter. I have never got one first probably. Otherwise, you're like sitting here for half an hour. <laughs> yeah, better that Chris does that. That's yeah, true. Exactly. <laughs> That's true. Start it up, man. Slim pickings, but we should get started. Wait, really? Why? The pressure is off, buddy. <laughs> All right, good morning. Uh, we're very few in numbers. There's just maybe seven of us here, I guess, but we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm just going to briefly introduce both of our speakers today. Uh, we're excited to have two of our residents talking to us. First, we're going to hear from Marshall Huang. He's one of our, uh, our first years or PGY2 uh, residents, and he's going to talk about passing on SciPass. So I don't see any Alcon reps here, so that's good. Um, and then we're going to hear from Chris Baer. <clears throat> He's going to talk to us about the ocular hazards of trumpet playing. We all kind of got our hopes up that there would be a live performance, but uh, Chris Baer's not feeling up to it today. So excited to have both of them. Uh, take it away, Marshall. Thanks to Dr. Burrow for that wonderful introduction. My name is Marshall Hillon, PGY2 resident here at the Marin Eye Center. And today I'll be talking about SciPass and why we decided to pass on it. So the story for SciPass, at least for the general public, begins in 2016 when they announced um, the SciPass microstem at the AAO meeting. Um, this was approved after a two-year data suggested that it was safe with no uh, significant adverse events. But then the story changed two years later, less than two years later, in 2018 when they decided to withdraw the SciPass microstem. They cite in their release that at the, po the two-year post-surgery group, there's little difference in endothelial cell loss between the side pass microstent and the cataract surgery only groups that were the controls. <clears throat> However, they extended the study to the, from the COMPASS to the COMPASS XT trial, where they collect an additional three-year data on the, uh, adding on to the two-year data they initially had. Um, at five years, they showed a statistically significant difference in endothelial cell loss compared to the group that was cataract only. This was really the only adverse event that they cited, and because of that, they decided to withdraw the side pass. They do note that it was out of abundance of caution, and they suggest that they may consider changing the labeling and reintroduce the side pass at a later date. Um, but they don't suggest what changes they might make. So, as far as they, uh, at least as far as they report, the endothelial cell loss was the only concern that they had. But when did we care about endothelial cells, um, at least in the setting of glaucoma? So the question is, what causes endothelial cell loss? Um, there have been many reports that suggest that increased IOP by itself, so glaucoma by itself, can cause endothelial cell loss. And there is indeed a trend um, towards decreasing endothelial cells with increasing uh, intraocular pressure. There are also studies that suggest aging causes a consistent decline in endothelial cell density. Um, reports show that there's a decrease anywhere from 0.3% per year to 1% per year um, in patients who aren't on other treatments or um, had other surgeries. Uh, this paper here is based on 211 patients from 20s to 90s, showing a consistent decline. <clears throat> There's even a question of whether topical glaucoma medication might cause endothelial cell loss. I don't think it's accepted that it does, but there are some studies that suggest that it might. Um, in this paper, they looked at dorzolamide, timolol, and bet uh, betaxolol, um, which all showed a, a decrease in endothelial cell density. Um, on average, this shows about 3.6 to 4.5% decrease uh, year over year. Um, on the left here, uh, this is looking at corneal thickness. Uh, you can see that there's no um, significant change in corneal thickness over this period of time. So this endothelial cell loss that they saw wasn't clinically significant. Um, on average, the patients here were about 80 years old and they all had glaucoma or ocular hypertension that deserved treatment with uh, glaucoma medications. 
And then eye surgery itself. Um, that could be cataract surgery, um, corneal transplants, um, or glaucoma surgery, all of which have been reported to decrease endothelial cell density over time. Um, the suggested mechanisms include mechanical damage, whether that's from direct corneal touching from either the implant or um, intraoperative techniques, or even from the uh, turbulence of the aqueous that goes through the implant or during the operation. Other studies suggest that it could be changes in the aqueous environment that causes damage to endothelial cells over time. Here's a review looking at um, some of the major glaucoma surgeries over time. And these are the reported endothelial cell losses year over year. Um, they range from 2.6% with the deep sclerotomy all the way up to 18% with the amplitude in that, achieved in that particular study. Um, you can see that's pretty significant. If you can imagine that's a year over year decline. And these are basically our most uh, common major glaucoma surgeries that we continue to do today. So the question is, what about the MIGS surgeries, or the, the microinvasive glaucoma surgeries? <clears throat> so first, we want to define what that might mean. And Zaheb and Ahmed defined MIGS with the following five factors, which are still relatively accepted today. Um, first is an ab internal microincisional approach. Um, there are some people who consider an ab external approach um, part of the MIGS category, but in general, most MIGS are ab internal. Um, they're minimally traumatic to the target tissue. So what that means is that we really want to preserve real estate in the eye in the event that they need additional glaucoma surgeries in the future. They obviously need to lower IOP because that's the goal. So all of these surgeries show some kind of IOP lowering efficacy. And there must be a high safety profile. Because these patients are usually moderate, mo uh, mild to moderate patient, uh, glaucoma patients, we need uh, this to be a first-line option so there can't be high uh, safety issues. And then there needs to be a rapid recovery with minimal impact. This is usually accomplished by combining it with cataract surgery, so there's little recovery time beyond what would be standard um, for them. So there are four general types of MIGs. Uh, the first is trabecular, which improves the trabecular outflow through Schlem's canal, generally either with an implant or by uh, bypassing it through a trabeculotomy or trabeculectomy. Um, in this presentation, I'll be focusing mostly on the implantable devices, the eye stent and the hydrus. Um, in this photo, this is an example of the hydrus. Um, this is a crescent-shaped device which helps the stent open the Schlem's canal. Um, whereas the eye stent is a heparin coated device that kind of creates a passage through Schlem's canal. <clears throat> the suprachoroidal uh, version is what the side pass is, and here is an example. So this improves the uveal scleral outflow as opposed to the conventional outflow by connecting the anterior chamber to the suprachoroidal space. Uh, you can see here it's kind of like a straw it goes right from the anterior chamber out and into the suprachoroidal space. Um, the eye stent supra uh, does a similar, uh, similar technique, except it's used, uh, it uses a titanium sleeve over a PES uh, tube. And then, in terms of a subconjunctival uh, type of mix, uh, here's the Zen gel stent which is a collagen-based device that brings, that directly shunts the flow to the subconjunctival space. Um, this kind of device is considered to be more effective, um, considered to have higher IOP lowering efficacy, and therefore has a less of a concern on the safety profile. This was approved because um, it was shown to be relatively similar to other tube shut devices, so it didn't require the same kind of approval processes that the um, trabecular devices required. And then finally, uh, this, the uh, endocyclophobic coagulation attacks the ciliary body, body epithelium to decrease aqueous humor production directly. <clears throat> so the question is, how effective are these MIGs? And how can we compare the safety profile versus the benefit of the MIGs? Um, you can see here, here's the, one, here's the ones I'll mainly focus on in this presentation. You can see the, the ranges 
from about 7.4 to 9.4 in terms of IOP lower, lowering efficacy of all of these implantable mixed devices. Um, here, this is the I-STEP, um, this is the Hydrus, the Cypass, and the Z. These are probably the most comparable in terms of their desired safety, efficacy, and their IOP lowering efficacy. So what was the data that finally caused them to recall the Cypass? You can see here, for the first two years, this is what they published initially. There's no significant difference between the side pass and the control, which were uh, cataract extraction only patients. <laughs> At year four, they first detect a significant difference, and here's the year five published <clears throat> data. Um, this chart here shows the percentage of patients who had greater than 30% endo uh, endothelial cell loss. Um, the paper suggested that the industry, or the regulators rather, um, requested that they include this data. And again, it shows a significant difference in the percentage of patients that have greater than 30% endothelial cell loss between control and uh, the side pass patients. Uh, it's notable that the month 36 time point is hard to interpret because they only had about 15, 16 patients or so in that time point. Um, but looking at that, how can we compare it to the safety outcomes of the other MIGS devices? Um, so here at the top, this is uh, from Durr and Ahmed. It's a great chart showing all the data, all the randomized control trials showing safety data and efficacy data of these MIGS devices. Um, so the iStent inject, you can see that all they have is 24 month follow up time, um, at least with endothelial cell loss data. They previously had, they have more than, they have 10 years of data published for the iStent overall, but they did not initially look at endothelial cell densities. Um, so all we have is 24 months, which shows no significant difference. They don't show the um, p-values or anything, but you can believe that. Um, the hydrous microstent showing also no large difference between the, uh, the treatment groups and the control groups, and not a large difference in the number of patients with greater than 30% endothelial cell loss. But if you see here, there's almost double and almost triple in these groups. Um, this is reported at 60 months, but it's actually worth knowing this is a, a 48 month time point that they report here, and this is indeed the 60 month time point. Um, as I mentioned before, the, gels, uh, the Zen gel stent was considered similar enough to other subconjunctival shunting devices, so they didn't require as much approval. Um, and therefore, they only have 12 months, and this was only with 11 patients or so. So not much safety data for the Zen. So this is the raw data that was published with the Compare XT trial. Um, it's kind of a busy chart, but I want to draw your attention to right down there. So this is the 24 month, month time point. Up here, this shows the, um, the endothelial cell densities that they measure. This is the change, and this is the percentage change. So overall, you see a 12% decrease and a 9% decrease compared to the microstent group and the control group. Not only, um, it's only until you get to year four and year five they see um, the significant difference appear. And as I mentioned before, we really don't have any data at all for the other, for the other devices. And if you look at just the data up to the two year time point, which is all we have for the other devices, it's about the same as what the other devices report. And then again, this highlights the 60 year time point. This is what they reported in that last chart, it's the 48 month, but showing the same information. Um, so here, this again shows a proportion of eyes with greater than 30% endothelial cell loss. If you note down here, there's no significant difference here. Um, it only appears at month 60, where it's not even statistically significant um, based on this analysis, but definitely approaching it. And in this paper, they separate also how many rings are available in the SIPAS device. So, I'll explain that in the next slide, but basically there are three retention rings that you can visualize as you implant the side pass. Um, in this case, they show, they separate the people with less than one ring available. So no rings available, one ring available, and two or more rings available. And you can see not so much difference here, but as you move to years four and years five, um, you can see that the difference in the percentage of patients with greater than 30% of the theocell loss is significantly different three or four times more with the patients with greater than two rings available. It is worth noting that they recommend implanting the device with one ring available. And if you do see multiple rings available, especially early on, you can consider 
moving the device or trimming the device, which they did in the study. Um, in this study, they showed that there are three patients with corneal, focal corneal edema, but not corneal decompensation. Um, there are also four patients that required trimming of the CYPAS implant. Um, usually trimming was done if it was found that more than two rings were seen within the first post-operative, the first post-operative week. And here um, is a chart kind of showing the last, uh, last tables data. So here's a control, which they took uh, the endothelial cell densities of patients six months into the control, so six months after cataract surgery. Um, here's the side pass overall, showing a statistically significant difference between um, the endothelial cell losses per year. And here, this is no rings, one ring, and two rings, and then three rings available showing a trend towards increasing endothelial cell loss as you have more of the side pass protruding. Again, this is about, this is what they initially published as a recommended implantation technique, one ring available. I um, mean, the difference between control and, uh, and that one ring is you know, about 1% difference. It's also worth noting that the control that they publish here is only 0.36% endothelial cell loss per year. As I mentioned before, even the natural course of aging, they publish 0.3 to 1% endothelial cell loss per year. And this is, these are patients that have undergone cataract surgery in addition to their normal aging process. Previous studies um, have reported much higher endothelial cells, uh, cell losses in the control itself. So here's an example of what I was talking about with the implantation. Um, here you can see three rings, one, two, three retention rings available. This is the collar that sits in the front. Um, and here is optimal implantation position. One ring available right here in the collar that's at the level of the, uh, of, of, excuse me, Schwalbe's line. And it's important to note that there shouldn't be any contact with the corneal endothelium because that would require either trimming or replacement of the device. And here's another view. This one shows <coughs> no rings available. And this uh, here is implanted at the collar. This is the anterior chamber OCT, showing the implantation of the device going into superchoroidal space. So the question overall is, did Cypass really deserve a recall? The endothelial cell loss was a subclinical finding. Nobody had corneal decompensation related to this endothelial cell loss, which makes sense because studies report that people generally have corneal decompensation at around 300 to 500 uh, square millimeters of endothelial cell density. Um, sometimes they have issues as high as 800, but most of these patients were far from that threshold. The two to three year data that was initially published when the device was approved is quite similar to other mixed devices, notably the Hydrus and the iStent. Um, no other data currently has any five year data that show endothelial cell loss. The Hydrus currently published their third year data and they're working on uh, four and five year data. So they will be published soon, but we currently don't have it. And when we compare the endothelial cell loss in the treatment versus the control arm, the control arm is very important. And in this arm, they had very low endothelial cell loss among the lowest reported in these uh, randomized controlled trials. And then further, when you subcategorize the groups into patients with just zero or one retention ring available, they had even lower endothelial cell losses, almost consistent with um, the other mixed devices or with uh, other reported controls um, in previous studies. It's worth noting that they do recommend having one retention ring available, at least in the initial publication, because they suggested that the device might be less effective if it was implanted too deeply with one zero retention ring available. They don't really make a comment on that in the compare XT, so we might have to see whether or not there's an efficacy change if you were to implant it a little bit deeper. But this does suggest that zero retention rings available at least causes less endothelial cell loss. <clears throat> and so I would ask maybe if anyone has a comment, what if instead of recalling the device, they change the implant implementation instructions? 
to suggest that it had to be um, either one or zero retention ring available. Does anyone have any thoughts about how that could have changed things, Dr. Sinclair? Yeah, have they looked at the relationship with the maybe corneal OCT between the depth of the implantation, not the extent, but maybe the depth of the implantation, those relatively closer to the cornea, causing more localized swelling of the cornea in that area and suggesting more endothelial cell loss. Have they looked at all at that? They, I don't know if they did it with OCT, but they definitely did it clinically. So the three patients that had some corneal edema, they're noted all to be a focal corneal edema right near the stent. One of those, uh, one of those patients had uh, two or more retention rings available, so that was trimmed. The other two were seen at, or the other two were seen as uh, subclinical, so they just watched those. Um, initially, they weren't even reported as adverse re events, and only in post-analysis that they decide that those were adverse. So I think overall they agree that the closer it is to the corneal endothelium, the more likely there is to be an issue, and that's kind of um, done with the retention rings because the more out it is because of the position, it's more vertical in the angle. The further out it is, the closer it is going, uh, going to be to the anterior chamber. Now these were the same concerns that we had with the occlusion and the bare valve that were coming from posterior and sort of angled, that the deeper you could implant it under the sclera and going into the anterior chamber, and the less amount of the tube available in the anterior chamber would seem to be associated with less uh, corneal secondary changes when you're trying to implant it in the anterior chamber. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that's a good point, um, and that's kind of what they're trying to suggest here. Um, they definitely do care about the same adverse events as they do with the tubes. The problem is that when you do a tube, you're, you mo more likely have a need for a higher intervention, higher IOP lowering, and you care a little bit less about the safety profile compared to these MIGS devices. So you certainly have the same concern, but I think with the MIGS, we have to be very careful about having a much higher uh, bar of uh, safety. In, in terms of uh, whether or not it's close to the endothelium, um, I think that could be worth checking uh, with a more objective test. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think it's a really interesting question if they could have just changed the recommendations. Uh, I also find it interesting that, you know, you, you asked the question, did it deserve a recall? Because, you know, the, as you stated, they hadn't had, you know, patients with decompensated corneas. They just had this accelerated endothelial cell loss. And, you know, if, I, if I'm the company thinking about this, one, I'm really thinking about my, you know, yes, I'm thinking about the patients, but I'm really projecting forward what, what's the potential financial cost if we do have patients that begin to decompensate. And I, I would assume that was the primary driver of why they, they recalled. And then Brian, um, I'd be curious, I, in my conversation with, with our glaucoma faculty, I never started inserting this because they said the complications were quite significant. I mean, you know, when you did have a complication, it was really, really difficult. So wonder if you think that might have something to do with pulling yeah. the trigger on the recall. Yeah, I don't, I'm not plugged in, so I don't know like all their decision process, but I think it did like, so some of the other ones like the eye stent or the hydrus have a better uh, risk to benefit profile. So for the side pass, I, I don't think it worked much better than those, but it's definitely riskier like just in terms of the surgery and so I don't know like about their implantation like how many they thought they were doing or like I, I don't know but I, I it probably was it probably was more that played into it than just the endothelial cell loss I think yeah I, I agree and I think those are both really good points um, I think the endothelial cell loss was the only thing they pointed to and the published data doesn't make it obvious how different the adverse events are between the different uh, MIGS devices. And there was an article that suggested that perhaps they were more worried about future litigation, and by doing the recall early, they protected themselves from future lawsuits and issues for the patients that have had it implanted already, since they've made this recall decision. And furthermore, they do seem to suggest to spin it off into potentially a sub-company where they might repackage it and re-release it. Dr. Mammos? I, I um, can't really tell you anything, or I'd have to kill you first, but um, I can say I do not first. disagree at all with your statements. 
<laughs> is, that, is that put nicely enough? You're safe. Okay, okay. okay. very good. Um, and I think it's worth noting that uh, other, t uh, oh, sorry, yes. No, one more. We've always done microstents and stuff in the superior quadrants because that's where we did the trabecular. That was our history. But that's where patients rub their eyes and may be distorting the stints more. Has anybody tried surgical procedures below? Um, I'm not sure, actually. That's a good thought. I hadn't thought about the eye rubbing component. Yep. Dr. Eric. Any patient, any studies show any uh, chemistry studies at all? They do, yes. Um, Yeah, that's, so that's a really good point, and almost all of these studies do indeed look at pachymetry, uh, central pachymetry, and um, they don't show any significant corneal thickening associated with the endothelial cell loss. And again, that's not necessarily unexpected because most of these patients still have well over a thousand um, cells per cubic per square millimeter of endothelial cell density, but they don't see it in our data. And yes? Just one other point, with, the, with these MIGS devices, um, is when you do run into a complication, how hard it is to fix it. So how can you get any of these devices out? Like side, side pass is particularly hard, I think, to uh, get out. And uh, I yes. think people have struggled with that. Um, yeah, so I think that is a, a major challenge with the side pass. Um, they mentioned that if you're trying to modify the side pass beyond seven to 10 days post-implementation, they suggest that removing it could cause more harm than good, and instead they would suggest trimming it, if at all possible. Before the seven day mark, they suggest that you can move it, but the fibrosis will be too severe to try to remove it later on. Um, unless it's you know, causing corneal decompensation where the benefits outweigh the risk. <clears throat> and another qu uh, question I had was whether or not there's a structural propensity to cause more corneal damage with this device than other mixed devices like the hydrus or the eye stent. Um, and some papers suggest that it does. Because it's a stiffer, oops. Because it's a stiffer implant, um, it's more likely to sit vertically in the angle. So if there's any change in the position of it, it's more likely to protrude out and touch the corneal endothelium than other mixed devices just because of how it's designed. Um, and then my final question here would be, why not just implant the hydrus? Based on the randomized control trial, it suggests that the hydrus is more effective with similar, a similar safety profile to the eye stent. And it's not recalled. And, it's and theoretically, there might be a higher IOP low efficacy of the hydrus compared to side pass anyways. So does anyone have any? Uh, like uh, thoughts, I guess, on why not implant hydras over any other mixed device? Or at least these implantable mixed devices? I guess just do hydras. I would. I'd totally do hydras. Okay. Well, I think that's, that's a good take on point then. Um, but in terms of related to the side pass itself, I think um, some things that we need to remember are that gonioscopy is essential when we evaluate a patient with a previous side pass implant. We don't necessarily need to intervene on them, but we need to be able to assess where exactly the side pass is, how many retention rings available, whether or not it's touching the cornea. Um, and only if there is actual corneal decompensation, which is clinically significant, do they recommend any kind of intervention. Overall, the safety profile is superior to traditional glaucoma surgeries, but the reason that it's not accepted is because we demand a much higher safety profile for all these MIGs. And as far as I can tell, there's no good evidence that endothelial cell loss doesn't occur at a similar rate, a higher rate or a lower rate, really, um, for any of these other MIGs devices, since we just don't have that data. That's really why I did that. Um, and finally, why do we care so much about the endothelial cells? Um, and in the end, of course we care because it keeps our corneas healthy. Um, we show that there is a decrease, a steady decline in endothelial cell density over time as we age. So it's important to preserve it as much as we can. And since there's almost no um, regenerative potential for the endothelial cells, um, there's really no going back. If we cause damage, that might cause 
issues 15 to 20 years down the line. And I think for that reason, it's very reasonable to be extra cautious for these patients with just mild to moderate glaucoma, usually just undergoing cataract surgery for the purposes of decreasing the drop burden. Um, as I mentioned, we don't see any clinical findings, no coronal decompensation, but with the amount of cells that we need to maintain detergestions, it's not unlikely that we did it. So, any questions, comments overall? Marshall, just Nick would know on this too, that historically, just uh, the early days of implants, just incredible how just implants were put in the eye. If you think about the endothelial layer, it just you know, it wasn't even recognized that was a problem. So the most common cause of corneal edema was pseudophagia, corneal edema in, in those years. So just how we progressed to really watch it now so carefully and be aware of it. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Um, and I saw that it looks like uh, at least topical medications and intravitreal medications all require monitoring of endothelial cell loss over time in order for approval. Um, and I was wondering if uh, anyone knew, maybe Dr. Madison knew, if that's required for IOLs these days for any other kind of implant. It's not required at this point, but to, to Dr. Harry's point, from 1984 to 1989, pseudophagic bullous keratopathy was the number one reason for cornea transplants in the U.S. So. I mean, it really was a, a major issue, and interestingly enough, there were anterior chamber IOLs and iris fixated IOLs that were approved and did not really show any endothelial damage during the first six months when they were evaluated. But two and three years later, slowly but surely, they were showing endothelial damage, eventually leading to corneal decompensation. So this is something that, that we should be aware of and that people should be looking at. Anyone else? Thanks for your attention, everyone.